Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. Sylvia, it is such a pleasure to have you today on our call for our We Choose to Thrive series. Thank you for being willing to courageously share your story and be a part of our We Choose to Thrive movement. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> and we're happy you're here. So tell us, um, Sylvia, a little bit of the story of the past that made you the woman that you are today. Okay, well, I guess um, I need to start. My story began 68 years ago, and I was born in El Paso, Texas, to young Hispanic parents. Um, I was the oldest of six children, and my childhood was dysfunctional due to alcohol abuse and infidelity. Mm. At 17, I got pregnant and married my high school boyfriend, and we had a little girl. So this began a 15-year abusive marriage. Um, I once again found myself in the cycle of alcohol abuse and infidelity by my husband besides physical and verbal abuse. Oftentimes when we grow up in those environments, we typically attract the same thing because we don't have a frame of reference. That's, it's what, it, what appears to be normal to us, even though we know we don't like it or whatever, but we if we don't have a good solid frame of reference from childhood, oftentimes when we start our adult life, uh, we attract the same things. Yes, right. We had a daughter together, and um, five years later, I had a second daughter. Somehow, I made it from one day to the next. I think a big turning point in my life was when I landed a great job with IBM, and I began to do well. I was very successful at work, but my home life was a mess. Mm -hmm. I think because of my success at IBM, I was able to muster up enough courage to leave when my girls were 14 and 9. So I found myself as a single mom with a huge hole in my heart. Oh, yes. And I strongly believe that if I found the perfect man, it would fill that hole. I know that story. I know that story well. <laughs> um, I spent many years going from one bad relationship to another. I struggled making poor choices. And over the next, what, 15 years, I was married several times. Struggled, just struggled. And I always chose men that were more messed up than I was so that I could feel okay about myself. I lacked, I lacked self-worth, and I truly believed that I was bad. Mm, I so understand that. It's, it's like, that's a part of my story as well. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's, I think it's something that's very common. Yes. I think I, um, or I know I began my healing uh, journey at the age of 48. When I was invited by my then mother-in-law to hear her piano solo at her church, I found God that day, and I um, asked Him to come into my heart and be the. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrendered my broken heart to Him. I began going to church. I began reading the Bible and studying the Bible with the help of my church family. And that filled in a lot of those missing pieces for you, didn't it? Yes, it did. But I had another bump in the road right away. Right after I started going to church, my then husband went on a mission trip to Russia where he fell in love. It was a 10-day trip, and he fell in love with his translator. <laughs> So once again, <laughs> I was brought to my knees yeah. and uh, found myself single again. Mm -hmm. But the difference this time was that I had faith. And that was the difference. 
And you also had a support system in the yes. background. Yes. yes. And I, I began, first, I learned what forgiveness was and accepted the fact that the Lord forgave me for all of the things that I had done that I felt guilty and ashamed of. And then I began to forgive my ex-abusive husband, forgive my parents, all the people that I had hurt and that had hurt me along the way. Um, I now had hope and there was light. There was light in my life. And forgiveness is something we do for ourselves first and foremost. That was the next thing I do. And the hardest thing was I began the long journey of learning how to forgive myself and liking myself, loving myself and being comfortable uh, with who I was and in my own skin. The hole in my heart was gone and I had joyful hope. That's beautiful. And, and you know, we, the, the journey to loving ourselves is probably one of the most difficult journeys because we've not, we don't have, we didn't have that in our lives. And understanding and forgiving ourselves is like the key. You know? it, it, it really is, but it was not an easy thing to do. No, no. And I would take, you know, three steps forward and and then five steps back, and then I, you know, so it was just like that. But during my healing, I remarried again, <laughs> and I, I've now been married 17 years, and I retired from IBM, and uh, after 36 years of service, and I began a my own business, which was another very positive part of my healing journey. I finally began to know why I had gone through everything that I had gone through, learned what my purpose in life was, and that was to help women and girls. Well, and that's where you and I have been connected mm -hmm. recently is you, you're in Seroptimus, and yes. there's a big journey there to, to helping women and girls to find themselves and to, right. to give them that hand up, that missing, that missing link. Tell us a little bit about Sir Optimus, then we'll go back to your story. Okay, well, um, let's see. Sir Optimus is a global volunteer education uh, organization working to improve the lives and, of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic um, em empowerment, specifically in the areas of education. So I personally and you also belong to a local club called Seroptimus International of the Kachinas and we have been serving the West Valley since 1980. So I love Seroptimus. I'm currently the vice president of our club. You can't have a pity party if you're helping others. So. <laughs> no, you really can't. When you mm -hmm. when you give of yourselves, it's mm -hmm. just makes all the difference in the world. And because of your background, you have the heart and the empathy and the caring. Because because you understand. You know? Yes, I do. Very much. So, what I want to do the rest of my life is just. Um, since I am in the winter years of my life, I just want to spend the rest of my life helping women and girls, specifically women and girls issues in the areas, specifically in the areas of domestic violence, teenage moms, single moms, women going through divorce, widows. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much my story. Well, the, the being able to help is because you're able to emphasize empathize with them and know the journey that they're on. And the other part of it, when I joined the Seroptimus, I was amazed at how many women had been in, in Seroptimus for 50 years, yes. for a very long time. And it's so amazing to think, you know, because that's, that says a lot for Seroptimus and the, the purpose behind it, because it's so easy to go, come and go in, in some of these things. But the very fact that so many have stuck with it and been a part of it, it's the part of the fiber of their lives and they're, they're involving their families too. So many of the younger generation is starting to wake up to understand that there is a support system too, you know, and, and 
we share it with our children and our grandchildren, our, you know, our daughters and granddaughters. And it's such an important place to be in learning to give and give back. Yes, you're in a group with like-minded or like everyone in, or I have found everyone in Soroptimus has a heart for women and girls. Right. So we have that common thread and you just develop great friendships and you have a good time while you're giving back. Very much. So Sylvia, what, going back to your story, was there a course you took besides being involved in your, your relationship with your God and your, your, your family, your church family that came yeah. from that? Was there courses that you took? Were there um, books that you read yes. that you could recommend to our listeners? Yeah, there, one of the very first books that I um, that helped me tremendously, helped me more than years of counseling and just working on trying to get better, is I took a, a class and I was given this book. I, I hope it's okay to just show it. It is. It okay. Is. So this is the book called It's Making Peace With Your Past. It's help for people from dysfunctional families, and it's written by Tim, Ple Tim Sledge, S-L-E-D-G-E, -E. and it's a 12-week course. You do homework every night. You read, you pray, you journal, and it starts with discovering self-esteem. It kind of turns you inside out, and at the end, it helps you put yourself back together and put a plan together to move forward. Wonderful. So it, it was an amaz amazing book, um, and you can do it just self-paced by yourself, or if you get a group of people, you could do it as a group, and there's a facilitator guide as well. Very good. So I, um, That's a good recommendation. Yeah. I, I'll, um, since I mentor some other women that are going through a hard time, I have used this study and it's really helped. Perfect. So that would be one thing. Another, another book that really helped me was, um, and this was later on in my healing journey, was The Purpose Driven Life by Rick. I read Warren. that. Very good that? book. Yeah. So this was, this is one of my favorites and uh, it's, yeah, it's written by Rick Warren and my favorite part is, is it starts off with, it's not about you. So that's the very first part of the book. And as soon as I opened it up and read, it's not about me, I'm thinking, wow. And then pretty much the book just tells you why we are, why you're here. So those two resources I would recommend. So Sylvia, on the, on your journey to healing, did you find that there were things that would trigger you to maybe fall back a little bit? Oh, yes. There were, there still is. That's what, you know, yeah. There still is, because I'm still on that journey. Mm -hmm. We um, all are. It's a continual journey. Yeah. I sometimes can hear a song, smell a smell, and I'm right back, right back to abuse and mm -hmm. trauma. But I don't wallow in it and stay there. I just kind of say to myself, okay, and I, I'm okay, and I accept that I, that I got that uh, feeling, and I'm okay with it, and just... Just, just laugh kind of, yourself through it? I kind of laugh about it, um, or, you know, oh, there you go again, Sylvia, you know, things like <laughs> that. I just kind of laugh at myself, and then I can just get out of it just as quickly as I got into it. I have found that when I notice triggers for myself that I acknowledge it, but sometimes I, I'll, I'll listen to something funny or I'll start singing a song, a crazy song that I enjoy, mm -hmm. something, and it, it, it's those trigger things that you snap yourself out of it. It's, the key is to being aware and watching what triggers you and when you feel yourself going into that to do something, to catch it and do something yeah. about it. Yeah. Sometimes I find myself um, just getting angry for no reason and then catching myself too and then pulling myself out of it. Very much, yep. 
I understand that very well. So if somebody, if you were, and I know you come across this very often, if somebody's just starting that journey, they're realizing just as you did, you get to that point where you know something's got to change and you don't want to live this kind of life. And if somebody was just to that place themselves and, and really becoming aware that they wanted to make some major changes in their lives, what would you say to them? I would say that you're going to be okay. And that if you give your life to God, then that begins your journey. Or I don't know what, how else to say. It just, it just helps. Um, another thing that I did that really helped me along the way was um, I made girlfriends. Mm -hmm. I've never really had girlfriends um, while I had my jewelry business, I, did, I went to many networking events. It was hard to go to the networking events because I didn't really feel like I fit in. Right. But I forced myself to go, and it became easier and easier to attend. And I found myself actually having fun, which <laughs> was foreign to me. <laughs> and I began slowly to discover who I was and that I had lost along the way somewhere and I began to let people in. So for me, it began with girlfriends. So did you also find that sharing your story or tell it, talking about your story made a difference too? Oh, yes. I think every time you tell your story, it brings, there's light. And yeah. you can't, yeah, there, healing does not happen in the dark, and, and, you know, until, until it's, or in my opinion, or in it felt life. like that to me. It felt like that to me. Right. It's like it, bringing it to the light releases it, sets it free. Yeah. Wow. And, and just every time I tell my story or when I'm mentoring somebody and I talk when they say something and then I can tell them that, yes, I was there and letting them know that they're going to be okay. Cause I'm okay. So <laughs> you're going to be fine, you know, and then I can help them put a plan together. And most certainly are not alone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I find many women that are hurting and many women that are, are broken. And I think my, my mission in life at this point is to encourage others and to lift other women up and give them hope. Your words of wisdom, you're sharing your story from your heart. I'm sure we'll touch at least what, you know, we always say if we could help one, it yes. would be totally amazing. But I'm thinking that the stories that I've been hearing from yourself, from all the other women that have embarked on this journey to, to speak up, stand up, and let our voices be heard, we're helping a lot more than just one. And when I see you interact like with our Seroptimist meetings and, you know, the wisdom that you share is beautiful. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it, Becky. You know, and to me, it's, it even gives, because we've all been on a journey and sometimes it's easy, it, sometimes we do slump backwards a little bit in, in that journey of healing. Mm -hmm. so but that's what, because of knowing each other's stories, we know what to watch for. We also know how to support each other, which is really a key. So I met a woman, young woman, she's in her early 20s that went through some really tough things. And she's participated in this book. And I look at the younger women that uh -huh. have gotten to this way earlier than most of us did and think, oh, wow. Just think of the years of anger and pity and sadness and hard times that they're there if they stay on the journey that they are currently on and they come to the awareness that they are on what leaders they can be. Yes, in our world. absolutely. Yeah. And yet, for those of us that are at the 60 mark and beyond, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, years of wisdom that we too can share. In, and oftentimes those young ones need to hear that these words of wisdom from us. Yes, yeah. absolutely. 
Thank you. That's our mission. Yeah, <laughs> that is our mission. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so very much for being part of this. We choose to thrive and sharing your heart, your, your courage, your wisdom with others. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.